Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Today, our presentation is Time versus Energy. Uh, glad you could join me here today, and um, we will get started. I'll leave some time at the end for any questions. Okay. Is anyone else losing track of time? During this pandemic, we might find that um, time has either gone by really fast for us or really slow. It's been kind of an unusual time period, hasn't it? I like this little cartoon here. Um, lockdown Groundhog Day, right? It does feel like Groundhog Day. Anything good on? There's a 6 p.m. news, but it says it's a repeat. <laughs> and each day kind of turns into the next and they all tend to be ten, a little bit the same. Now there is something called time blindness, and this is defined as no concept of what time it is now, how much time is left and how quickly time is passing. Um, and some pe for some people, whether it's a pandemic or not, they, I guess it's, a, it's a, maybe a psychological kind of thing that, that some people have, but I think now we all kind of have time blindness now, and it does feel somewhat strange. Um, so what, what are we going to talk about today? We'll be talking about managing time, managing energy, and eating for high energy. And I'll leave um, some time at the end for questions, but we will get started. So managing time. Whenever you go to a time management webinar, or if you've been to, you know, back in the day, a seminar in person, and, and Usually, the first thing that people ask when you are talking about managing your time is setting goals. What is important to you? What are your dreams? We're going to be a lot better managing our time and working, you know, doing it effectively if we really kind of sat down and figured out what is important to us and what's not important to us. Um, not only will this help us prevent us wasting time, but it'll also help us to really focus on what is important to us. During this pandemic, um, you know, during this winter time, we are on lockdown. And winter is coming is kind of this uh, very kind of ominous sound. If you watch Game of Thrones, you're familiar with that, that theme of, of Game of Thrones, that winter is coming. Um, but here, I'm looking outside my window now. We are definitely in winter. Currently, for sure, we've got like a foot of snow outside, right? Um, but winter is about 2,200 hours. And so if we divide that into um, time spent working and time spent um, sleeping, we have a third of the time is actually free time. That's 728 hours of free time this winter. Normally we're running here, there, and everywhere trying to, to do stuff, but it, that is kind of amazing that we have that much time during this winter. What could we do with that time? Have, you know, have we really kind of thought through our goals and thought through what's important to us? Now, certainly if you're a parent of children, <laughs> you don't have 728 free hours, uh, but for, for those of us with teenagers or, or no kids in the house, um, you know, potentially it's a lot of time. What could we do with that time? And part of, you know, managing time productively is um, setting clear tasks for ourselves. And, you know, we, we set clear goals. Now, you know, for our daily tasks that we're going to do, we've all heard before about breaking down these large tasks. How do you eat an elephant? Right. And it's a cliche and, you know, many time management courses always talk about that. Right one bite at a time. So breaking down those really difficult tasks and you know, not putting on your to-do list, I need to you know, work on my web page, but specifically, what will you do of that particular task? Break it down and be very specific. Several years ago, maybe seven years ago, I think now, I, I did a web page for my company and man, was that a lot of work. And uh, you know, for some people, maybe it's, it's super easy, something that comes very easy to them. But for me, that was a lot of work. And so if I had just written down work on web page every day, that would have been overwhelming. But if I had just a small, clear task that I could work on every day, it, it was much easier. 
Now, another thing too is um, using the Eisenhower matrix. Is anyone familiar with the Eisenhower matrix? So this is attributed to General Eisenhower during World War II, where he had a lot of, um, you know, obviously managing, uh, I guess, uh, D-Day invasion and, and uh, you know, managed so much during World War II, and he would have to come up with what, you know, prioritize what was important and what wasn't. And so he came up with this box, it's called the Eisenhower box. A lot of people, you know, are maybe familiar with it from Stephen Covey, but it's really attributed to Eisenhower. And so he would divide it into four quadrants. And the top quadrant would be things that are important and urgent. So the things that are green are the things that you're going to want to do for the day, right? So either you do it right away, or if it's not urgent, you need to schedule it. Because what happens when things are important but not urgent? We, we say, oh, I know I need to do that. It kind of weighs on us. But you know what? No one's waiting for it right now. And so let me just kind of push that back. Um, as someone who owns their own business, for me, uh, this is kind of something that I've had to struggle with because things you know, for my business are important. But if no one's saying, hey, I need this now, when does it get done? And so that's something that's really important to schedule it um, because if you don't schedule it, it doesn't get done. Now, the things that are not important, we either can delegate them. So maybe they're urgent, but maybe not necessarily important. Could you delegate it to somebody else? And the things that are not important and not urgent, why are you even doing them? For my... Um, I was talking to my mom the other day on the phone and she was telling me that um, she's, all, you know, late seventies. She's been retired now for 10 plus years. And she was telling me that she doesn't have any time to do stuff. And I'm like, well, mom, we're in the middle of a pandemic and you're retired. So what are you spending your time with? And she's like, oh my goodness, my emails, they take so long. And I thought, well, you're not working. What, what's taking so long with all your emails? And it turns out she, she's just getting like literally hundreds of emails a day from different things that she signed up for that she feels like kind of she needs to respond to every day. And so I said, no, only, you know, you need to be really clear and go through your email box and delete everything that's not important so that you're not wasting all this time with it. Be really, you know, be vicious about deleting stuff. Um, and get that out of there. So if it doesn't bring you joy in your email box, you know, you don't have to work anymore. So why not just get rid of it? All right, so moving on to staying productive. And how do we stay productive? Well, as somebody who has their own business, um, this is also something that I've struggled with over the years as well. And for this, I go to James Clear. Is anyone familiar with James Clear? James Clear is an author. He wrote a book um, called Atomic Habits. It's a really, really great book if you're, if you're not familiar with it. Um, and he has a website called jamesclear.com, um, writes extensively about being productive and reaching goals and managing time. And so um, really great, great person to follow. But here, he, and he's got lots of little infographics, but he kind of talks about the physics of productivity and objects in motion tend to stay in motion, right? It's just getting started. And so many times we have something that we've procrastinated on and we push it off and it just even getting started, then we, oh, this wasn't so bad. And then we've got that momentum going. So how can, how can we do that? Well, we can do the worst thing first. Um, so when we're putting our days list together, doing the, the you know, putting that chore that, uh, that absolutely needs to be done, that maybe we've been procrastinating and just get it out of the way. And then the rest of the day seems easy, doesn't it? Um, I have a little sticky note that I put onto my calendar and I, you know, kind of to remind myself, if I only got one thing done today, what would that one thing be that I would be at the end of the day that I would say, oh, you know what, at least I got that done. And let me get that out of the way first. Um, some other things that you can do is the Pomodoro method. So if you're familiar with the Pomodoro methods, that, that's working in 25, incre 25 minute increments. And so you set the timer for 25 minutes. I have an app on my phone called Focus Keeper. 
um, and it's 25 minutes and then you get a five minute break and then you start in another 25 minutes. Um, it's called Pomodoro because the person who came up with this used a timer that was a tomato timer. Um, and uh, so they saw these little Pomodoro timers. Now, Pomodoro is the Italian word for tomato. Uh, another thing that's been really hugely helpful for me is something called Focusmate. If, if you are familiar with this, Focusmate um, is a, um, I guess it's a, a website and you, you get a certain amount for free, but that you sign up and you work with someone together. So here I am, this is a screenshot of me in the corner. I've cut out the person that I'm working with, but basically uh, you're working together. You sign up, it's 50 minutes. You, you talk at the beginning and you say what you're going to work on. Um, but what, what makes it so effective is that there's that social pressure to work because you know, you know somebody's working on the other end, you've agreed to work together. It's the intention set setting. Um, you're very task specific. And then there's the accountability at the end. You meet up at the end and you say, hey, did you get done what you said you were going to do? Um, and we all, to some extent, act a little differently when we know we're being watched. So nobody is really watching at the other end. They're working on their own stuff. They're not sitting there staring at you. But just that thought that maybe someone is kind of checking up on us um, is enough for me to get kind of motivated to, to do some stuff. So that, that has worked very well for me. And in the meantime, I've actually met some really nice people on here that we've kind of got our own group now and we don't even really use Focusmate anymore. So, um, but it's, it's a nice tool. I know some people, some of my friends and family think that it's really kind of strange, um, but it's worked really well for me. So maybe that, that could be something to try too. Okay, so let's talk about when we can do it. Our energy levels go up and down throughout the day. So if I were to ask you, when are you most tired during the day? When do you feel like your energy levels are the lowest? If you're like most people, you would probably say anywhere from like one o'clock to maybe four o'clock, right? That afternoon slump. For most people, it's maybe around two o'clock, three o'clock, right around there. I've never had a person tell me, oh, it's at, you know, 11 a.m. in the morning. No, because, um, you know, typically we are circadian rhythms go up and down. And some of that is impacted also by something called chronotype. So this book is called The Importance of When by Daniel Pink, also a really great book. He talks about managing your energy, not your time. When are you most energetic? What is your chronotype? Um, chronos is the Greek god of time. So what's your time type? Um, my husband used to work for the, the time clock company called Chronos, so that, that's how I know that. Um, but, you know, for some of us, we are an early bird, some of us are a mid, what they call a middle, and some of us are night owls. And a, a person's chronotype is a natural tendency based on circadian rhythms for an individual to sleep at a particular time during a 24 hour period. So are you someone who likes to get up early or do you like to sleep in and maybe go to bed late? Um, I always joke that even though I'm middle aged, my parents are still telling me when to go to bed because um, it's genetic. So if you have two parents that are early birds, there's a good chance that most likely you will be an early bird as well. Um, and so here we go. Here's the midpoint of sleep and the percentages of the population. Most of us are middles. I myself am a middle. Um, and so for me, the, mi the midpoint of sleep is about 4 a.m., 3 or 4 a.m. You know, if you go to bed at 11 p.m., you know, and divide eight hours in, in the half, add four hours to 11, that's 3 a.m. So most people, you know, go to bed around 11 and sleep until seven or so. Um, but then you have people at either end, the night owls and the early birds. And for them, you know, it's, it's much different, much uh, skewed differently. So kind of how can we take advantage of that too? If you're a, an early bird, getting up early and doing a lot of work first thing in the morning for you is going to be helpful. If you're a night owl, maybe you do a lot of work in your evening. Um, and so here you can see whether you're an early bird or a night owl, for most people, positive food, excuse me, mood and energy rises in the morning 
dips in the afternoon and then rises again in the evening. And here, this is the afternoon slump. This is the trough. So how can we take advantage of that? Um, so in the morning, and you know, if you're, once again, if you're a night owl, you're kind of pushing this back a little bit. But when we first get up, get up, it's really good for analytical tasks, for things that are gonna require a lot of brain power, better to do in the morning. The trough is, you know, that two to three period. Um, that's good for just routine stuff, maybe things that don't require a lot of energy. Um, and then the recovery time is, you know, later on towards the evening again. This is good for insight problems, brainstorming, Things that take a little bit more creativity actually are very good to, to do in the, the recovery time. What, what are maybe some barriers to concentration and our productivity? Uh, poor quality sleep, obviously, uh, dis digital distractions, the standard American diet, stress and anxiety, all of these things are kind of barriers for us, different, maybe different medications. Um, but let's focus on the two things that really are kind of important, uh, exercise and diet. So we know exercise is incredibly important for concentration. Here's a, kind of a brain map of kids before and uh, with exercise and no exercise. And you can see the, the kids' brains are so much more active, so much better able to focus when they exercise versus not exercising. Um, for kids with ADD and ADHD, kind of the first line of defense is um, it, it, per, literally prescribing exercise. When my kids were in elementary school, they had a program before school. It was an exercise program, and it was meant to help the elementary school kids, you know, focus during the day um, because the science was so strong that that really can be, can be so helpful. Um, and now let's talk about eating well for energy. What are the five different strategies? So managing blood sugar levels, eating real foods, increasing omega-3 fatty acids, uh, supplementing wisely, hydrating properly, and exercise. So we're gonna talk, really focus on the, the top three. So what is, you know, when we talk about energy, well, we, we've talked a lot about energy so far, right? About managing our energy levels and being productive, but what, what really kind of in our body, what produces energy? And energy is the power generated in our cells that allows our body to function, right? That generates heat, that uh, allows our muscles to move, our brain to think. All of that is a physical energy. And just like a car would use fuel, a jet would use jet fuel, um, we use something called ATP. And how is, a, how is ATP produced? Um, by mitochondria. Mitochondria are called the powerhouses of the cell. So if you remember back to like eighth grade biology, you'll remember that, you know, that was the powerhouse of the cell. Um, each and every cell has about anywhere from 500 to 2,000 of these mitochondria in each cell. They're found in all cells of the body except for red blood cells. And what they do is they take nutrients and oxygen and they convert it into our major fuel source, that ATP, which is, you know, adenosine triphosphate. Mitochondrial division is stimulated by cell demand. So the, um, the more we demand of our mitochondria, the more they multiply, the more they reproduce, and the more mitochondria we have, the more ATP we're producing. That's why, that's why exercising is so good for our energy levels because we are actually demanding more of our mitochondria and we're producing more, more energy. Um, so moving on towards then, how do we manage our energy levels with the food that we eat? So number one would be managing blood sugar levels. How do you feel when your blood sugar levels get low? Well, for most of us, we feel tired, sluggish, hangry, right? Um, and so, you know, when I first started doing this presentation, maybe 10 years ago, one of my first recommendation was maybe to, to eat breakfast, right? And get our, our energy going and provide enough energy for ourselves. But in the meantime, a lot of research has really been done on intermittent fasting and the fact that our body has these big stores of energy that we actually can use for energy. We just have to allow our body to be able to, to access it. So really kind of paying attention to the foods and the timing that make you feel sluggish versus energetic. 
um, making sure that you're combining high quality carbohydrates with protein and fat, that you're limiting refined carbohydrates, and that you're too avoiding overeating at lunch because you don't wanna go into the trough already feeling stuffed and kind of sluggish. And now it's two o'clock in the afternoon and you're feeling even more sluggish. But going back to limiting refined carbohydrates, why do we wanna limit refined carbohydrates? Well, they tend to raise our blood sugar levels rapidly and then decrease them rapidly as well. And here you can see this is something called the glycemic index. And so foods are kind of rated versus how fast, in general, for most people, they raise blood sugar levels. And so if something, if a food has a high glycemic index, it raises your blood sugars fast, you secrete a lot of insulin, which helps, you know, that blood sugar, that sugar enter into our cells from our blood, and then sometimes it comes crashing down. Uh, low glycemic index foods kind of keep our blood sugar levels stable. So how do we manage our blood sugar levels with it using the glycemic index? All carbohydrates are compared to glucose, which would be 100. High glycemic index foods would be anything over 70. And look at this, instant oatmeal is 83. So instant oatmeal raises our blood sugars really, really rapidly, and then they come crashing down. I've had so many people say, oh my gosh, I, you know, I, I, I'm eating healthy in the morning. I'm eating oatmeal for breakfast, and, and, but oh my gosh, by 10 o'clock, I feel so tired and hangry. And, I'm, and I, I usually say, well, let me guess, it was probably instant oatmeal, right? And they say, yeah, how do you know? Well, it's, it tends to do that for a lot of people. Now, look at this versus the low glycemic index foods. Barley is 28, steel cut oats, 38. So these are really, you know, much, much lower. And they're digested slower and they give us energy over time. So what are some of the refined grains and carbohydrates that maybe we wanna avoid? Things like white bread, white rice, crackers, bagels. I've, you know, put bagels in big, huge capital letters because not only are they refined carbohydrates, but they are also, <laughs> you know, many of them, four servings of bread in one bagel. So it's a huge load and, um, you know, very, very refined. Um, even the whole wheat bagels, they, they, most of the flour in a whole wheat bagel is not whole wheat flour, um, it's, it's white flour. And whole wheat flour will also, because it's a flour, will also raise up your blood sugar levels too. Um, I like this quote from David Ludwig, you know, since the dawn of our species, humans have consumed foods that are digested slowly, supporting our energy and metabolism for hours after eating, right? That's what's supposed to happen after a meal. We are supposed to feel good for a couple of hours later. However, in our fast food, fake food culture, we've become dependent on high glycemic foods that are digested quickly and raise blood sugar levels rapidly. So here's the healthy eating plate. You can see half of the plate is fruits and vegetables. Um, then there's whole grains, healthy proteins, some healthy oils. And this kind of gives us a nice picture of you know, what, what types of foods are going to su support our digestion and energy for hours after eating. Um, whole, real foods that, you know, a lot of plant-based foods as well. And that goes into number two of supporting our energy levels is eat real food, mostly plant-based. Uh, multiple studies have been done on this and there, there have been several studies. This kind of rodent study kind of stood out to me. They fed these rodents for three weeks. They got a junk food rat chow. So however they, you know, it was probably high in sugar, high in refined carbohydrates and high in refined oils, really highly processed. And they found that um, after three weeks, these rats were not performing as well as they normally did. They, you know, independent of their insulin levels and everything else, but they have a decrease in their cognitive performance. Um, and so that equals decreased mental energy, right? Um, now we are not rats, but we can extrapolate a lot of that. And I would say even as humans, we've probably all found that. What happens when you go away, maybe on vacation and extended vacation, and maybe you're eating a lot of fried clams, a lot of ice cream, a lot of, you know, French fries, and you come back and you're like, oh, I'm feeling sluggish. Like I'm not, you know, my brain's not working as well. Um, so, you know, when we look at this diet, all of these foods with all of these different colors, 
um, provide us the nutrients to support our energy, to support our mitochondria and keep our mitochondria healthy. Look at how beautiful all those colors are. We've got, you know, some, the blue, that's anthocyanins, provide that blue color, that's an antioxidant. Um, you know, the, some of the red would be from lycopene and all these different colors are, are basically plant chemicals that keep us healthy. Now compare that to a, a processed diet, right? We're not seeing as many colors and it's a little more bland and not quite as colorful. And this processed diet, um, you know, study after study shows that it really, you know, might taste good in, in the short term, but for our energy levels, for our mental, you know, processing speed, um, it's just, it's really, you know, no bueno, <laughs> it's not good. Um, so kind of, you know, if we had a really expensive race car, we'd be putting in the high octane fuel. And the high octane fuel is this type of stuff. Um, this is low octane fuel. This is what you put in, you know, in a car that you don't really care how it performs. And if you were to put this into a high performing race car, what would happen? The engine would knock and it really, it would not perform as well. And it's the same, you know, that, that analogy cannot be applied to us as well. And then number three would be to increase omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids we know are really important for our brain functioning. They're important for our mitochondria as well. Um, those mitochondria membranes are made up of fat. And so if we're eating the real whole healthy, real types of fats that are, um, have, are high in omega-3s, that's gonna be beneficial. So where do we find these omega-3s? Well, the most beneficial omega-3s are the DHA and EPA. These, this, these contain most of the health benefits. Um, you find them in fatty fish like salmon, herring, mackerel, sardines. Um, you find them in eggs, but only in eggs from chickens that are fed greens and insects and are allowed to forage or maybe are fed you know, chicken chow. Um, when we talk about you are what you eat, this is a perfect example of that. If you feed chickens that have no omega-3 fatty acids, guess what? They don't, they produce eggs that don't have any omega-3s. Uh, so, you know, many cartons will say on the, on the, the egg carton will say, you know, contains 70 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids. And then, you know, those chickens either were allowed to forage or, um, had chow that was supplemented with omega-3s. Alpha linolenic acid, ALA, you find um, in plant-based foods. This is only partially converted by the body, so you need, you know, actually more of it for your body to be able to, to make the amounts necessarily for the EPA and DHA. But you find these things in things like flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, um, to a lesser extent, leafy greens, Brussels sprouts. Uh, those would be all the plant-based sources of omega-3s. And then just kind of, you know, as we kind of close up here, kind of remembering too that energy begets energy. And so number one, exercising, right? We're expending a lot of energy, but guess what? We're actually building up energy. We're building up those mitochondria. We're demanding more of the mitochondria. And when we demand more of the mitochondria, they actually multiply and produce more energy. So it's kind of that energy paradox that the more we, the more we exercise, actually the more energy that we have. The other thing is body posture. Maybe you saw me kind of sitting up a little straighter there, but paying attention to your posture as well. Um, you know, when we're working all day over our computer and kind of slumped over that, that drains our energy, but you know, a high energy position would be kind of sitting up looking around, looking away from our computer, um, you know, stretching a little bit, maybe getting into that superwoman or superman position, you know, with your kind of arms on your hips and your legs, you know, it kind of in the V shape and that, that's that superman position. It also gives us a lot of energy. So, and then, you know, kind of acting the way that you want to feel when you're looking for that little energy boost, um, you know, dancing around the kitchen and doing something that requires a little bit of energy and acting energetic can help boost your energy a little bit. But then keeping in mind too that energy is valuable and should be protected. How do we protect our energy? Well, one way to do that is maybe staying away from some of the things that drain our energy. And what drains your energy? 
Um, maybe it's negative people. Maybe it's spending too much time on social media. You know, whatever it is for you, being aware of what makes you energetic and what potentially drains your energy and, and um, protecting that. So in summary, you know, we've talked a, a lot about the food, managing your blood sugar levels, eating whole real food, lots of omega-3s, exercising. And then too, when we talk about managing our time, you know, setting goals, managing procrastination and paying attention to when. So um, thank you so much for joining me here today. Um, are there any questions that anyone has? Um, were there any takeaways for you of something that, you know, um, you know, really kind of stuck with you? So, well, all right. Well, then I'm going to um, say goodbye to everyone and thank you so much for, for joining me here today. Um, it was nice.